everybody, welcome to another YouTube video. Today we're going to be talking about another one of the subscriber requests, which was disassemble a failed turbocharger and let's go through how the actual turbo failed. I wanted to get an IS38 for the Golf 7R followers and disassemble one of those, but I didn't have one. So what I've decided to do is use one of the other turbochargers that basically came in. It was a new, brand new, genuine turbo that was purchased from us. Uh, installed, failed, and obviously returned to us for a failure analysis. So the client basically wants to know what the cause of failure is so that he can go and correct whatever the cause of the actual failure, the failure mechanism as we refer to it. And once he's gone and corrected that, he will then obviously have an idea as to uh, what to do on the vehicle to correct the actual failure mechanism. And then he can obviously either repair the turbo, depending on what we find over here, or replace the turbocharger and obviously reinstall into the vehicle. So. What we've got here today is a Garrett Turbo. Um, I believe it comes off an H100. What I'm going to do is just take this intake pipe off. So let's just, for the guys that are basics, um, the guys that don't actually know what's going on with turbos or what the actual terminology is, this is the compressor stage. This is the turbine stage, the hot side, uh, the cold side, the air intake side, the exhaust side. So those are basically your uh, uh, different sides of the actual turbo. That's your actuator or your wastegate as people will refer to it. It's actually called an actuator. The correct term for the swing valve, the actual flap that opens and closes to regulate your boost is actually known as your swing valve. So first things first, I've already gone and taken this little clip, which basically the retaining clip which holds the actuator arm onto the swing valve or onto the crank, which is attached to the swing valve. I've taken that off. I'm gonna pull this little arm off and you'll see that the swing valve moves freely. First thing we do is we inspect the actual swing valve ceiling face. Now this turbocharger didn't last very long, so it's highly unlikely that this ceiling face over here has got any cracks. Um, at the same time, there's no abnormal play, there's no axial or radial movement inside of the bush which is pressed into the actual turbine housing or the exhaust housing or the hot, uh, the hot side housing. What I'm going to do now is just pull this intake off. I want to just see what the turbine, sorry, the compressor wheel looks like inside of the compressor housing. I've already just nipped or broken the nip on the, on the bolt, so I'm just going to unscrew this. This turbo hasn't been disassembled yet. This is the first time we are disassembling it take this little pipe off so that we can get to the compressor wheel. Now you'll notice that there's a lot of oil leakage around the compressor side of the turbo and not much leakage. This is just soot buildup. Okay, so it's dry on the turbine side, exhaust side. So I'd like to just check and see just by eye whether or not there's any foreign object damage. So the first thing I look for is foreign object damage. That is impact damage which you will find that has contacted or come into contact with the leading edge of those blades. Now, there's no contact damage or, or foreign object damage, impact damage onto the leading edge of the blades. Next thing I do is I look for radial play, there's not much, and then I look for axial play. That's axial across the axis, that's radial up and down, and there's not much play. This feels to be okay, but obviously that's not a uh, comprehensive analysis of this. I'm gonna take an eight, eight mil spanner, these bolts have just been, uh, 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 the nip has just been t uh, uh, loosened. So I'm going to just unscrew all of these, pull the compressor housing off so we can reveal the compressor wheel underneath and the back plate. And then I will show you what it looks like inside. We'll go through the actual rotating assembly, the bearing system, and all the individual components so that we can understand exactly what happened to this turbocharger. Now a turbo like this, which was installed onto a vehicle brand new, that oil is very dirty. It shouldn't be that dirty. When you replace a turbocharger, you need to replace oil, oil filter, depending on the mileage, oil feed line, oil return line, etc., etc. every time. Okay, first of all, let's just get these bolts out of the way. First thing I do is I have a look on the inside of the compressor housing, it's full of oil. So, the first thing that we can note here is that the split seal ring 
Okay, turbochargers don't have seals. This is known as a split seal ring or piston ring. It looks and works exactly like a piston ring which is situated on the compressor side and you have one or sometimes two on the turbine side as well. We'll get to that just now. So oil is pushed past this piston ring or split seal ring. Compressor wheel seems to be fine in terms of the blade uh, uh, composition. There's no damage, there's no bent blades. Next I want to do is just remove the turbine housing. This is a 10 mil spanner. Difficult to get in here. You're gonna need tiny little fingers. Right, so a big old mess. I'm gonna get to this now. Right here. Now before I show this to you, I'm gonna just put this rotating assembly or core assembly or CHRA back into the housing. And I want to show you something. First of all, let's do the, co the, the, the compressor side. From externally, you can only see the inducer blades. You get inducer and exducer. This is the inducer blades. This is the air inlet. And the exducer blades are the wider section of the compressor, which is the air outlet. It basically draws air in through the air filter, compresses the air, forces it through the volute of the compressor housing and back out, either through an intercooler and then into the engine, or in some cases on diesel engines, directly out back into the intake. So the same thing happens on the turbine side. Okay, now once in the housing, all you can see is the inducer blades. You have to pass the radius profile before the exducer blades fit inside of that area over there. You cannot see the compressor wheel's exducer blades from looking at it through the inlet of the compressor housing. The same thing applies on the turbine side. So it's a little bit different though. The air inlet on the turbine or exhaust side comes into the volute, gets compressed and comes into contact with the inducer blades, which is the wider section of the blade and then the air coming out of the turbine housing is the narrower section of the blade. You can only see the exducer, narrower section of the turbine side, blade through the turbine housing. When you take this out, it will reveal to you the, ex the, the inducer blades. Now, I don't want to show that to you just yet. I want to show you a, another turbine wheel, and there's a reason I'm going to do this. I want to show you another turbine wheel um, that I can just go over the inducer and exducer blades for you quickly. Okay, so this is a turbine wheel. Remember we spoke about inducer blades. These are the blades that sit inside of the turbine housing, which you cannot see from outside. These are the exducer blades. Inducer, that's air in, which comes into contact with these blades over here. And they pass through the exducer, escaping out of your exhaust, your downpipe, into your catalytic converter. Inducer, exducer. Now, let's take a closer look at this specific turbo. What do you notice? Where are the inducer blades? They're missing. How's that possible? Well, let's take a closer look. In order for us to do that, I'm going to remove or disassemble this rotating assembly, remove the shaft and give you some nice close-ups of the inducer blades or this turbine shaft and I'll explain to you exactly what happened to this turbo. This is a very elementary, basic uh, a diagnosis on the specific turbo. It is foreign object damage suffered to the inducer blades of the turbine wheel. Everything that you see over and above this is secondary to this, this uh, failure mechanism. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna disassemble this rotating assembly now. It's actually quite easy to do. You can actually hold the turbine wheel with a cloth, believe it or not. Uh, make sure it's quite thick so you don't cut your fingers and you just loosen the shaft nut. Now, just a point on this, this is very interesting, that is the direction of rotation on this specific turbo, it's clockwise when looking at the compressor wheel. Clockwise direction, the nut tightens anti-clockwise and loosens in the same direction of rotation. I'm turning the nut clockwise and you can see it's busy coming off of the shaft. So there's a reason for this, this is reverse thread. The reason for this is during rotation, during operation, the nut
cannot loosen because it is reverse thread. As the turbine rotates or the assembly rotates clockwise, the nut tightens in an opposite direction. Nut comes off. You can just pop that out with your fingers. A lot of oil build up at the back of the compressor wheel. That's what it should look like. Let's pop the shaft out. Once again, a lot of oil, that's fine. Just want to clean this up so that you're not looking at a, a dog's breakfast. Just grab a cloth and just clean up the bearing system. All right, so we have the turbine shaft in front of us now. Now what I want to do is I just want to point out a few things to you. The inducer blades are supposed to be wider than the extrusor blades. These blades are missing. Now if you have a look at a close-up, you'll actually notice that the blades have suffered impact I'm going to turn this to face towards you. That is the direction of rotation. Okay, remember, from the compressor side, I'm going to put the compressor wheel onto the shaft. When looking at the compressor, it's clockwise. I'm going to continue turning it clockwise, and I'm going to turn it around. As soon as you turn from the compressor stage clockwise to the turbine side, turning in the same direction, the turbine side direction is anti-clockwise. Now have a look at these blades, or where the blades were. If you take a closer look, you'll actually see that there was impact damage suffered that bent the blades opposite to the direction of rotation. That is the direction of rotation, and the blades bent in a clockwise direction. That indicates a clear impact between some foreign object, a hard, large particle foreign object, and the turbine wheel blades. That's the inducer blade, extrusor blade. Now, Let's ask the question, how did the turbocharger leak oil? Well, it's quite simple. As soon as you suffer any foreign object damage to either the compressor or the turbine wheel, it will create an imbalance in the rotating assembly. Now that imbalance is the same as taking a brick, tying it to your front wheel of your car and driving down the highway at 100 k's an hour. You're going to get an extreme vibration, which is then going to obviously abnormally wear the bearing system. Let's disassemble this and have a look at the bearing system inside. I'm going to pull the back plate off here and then disassemble everything so that you guys can get a nice clear view of the bearing system. I'll explain how the bearing system works. Okay, so the back plate is off, I'm going to take the bolts out. Inside of the back plate you have an insert. That's the little insert there. It's a steel insert which pops out the opposite side. And remember we spoke of a piston ring or a split seal ring. That is what I'm going to show you now. There is that little split seal ring and as you can see the gap over there, that indicates the likeliness or the likeness that it has to a piston ring which fits inside of your engine. Right, now oil has passed past this ring, past the back plate and come out from underneath the compressor wheel. Compressor wheel sits in there, the oil leaked out, remember when we took this comp wheel out, it was full of oil in the back disc, so it has leaked, oil has leaked past this piston ring which seals inside of that back plate and past the back of the compressor wheel entering into the compressor housing. Next thing we find inside of the bearing housing is a thrust bearing. Now before we get there, let's just show you how this assembles. So that is essentially how this steel thrust collar mates onto the thrust bearing. Those are the thrust pads on the thrust bearing, which I'm going to remove. I'm just going to clean them. I'm going to keep it in the same orientation. I'm just going to clean this thrust bearing so you guys can get a better view of what's going on. Those are the thrust pads. So any axial movement during rotation, any movement across the axis will basically be absorbed by the thrust pads on both sides of this thrust bearing. Now if you take a closer look, the thrust pads, you'll have to come real close to have a look at the actual wear on these pads. 
you'll see the same wear characteristic on both sides. Have a look at the actual pads themselves. Next, we have a retaining pin, which is that little guy over there. This specific bearing system is known as a semi-floating bearing system, which means the bearing stays stationary inside of the bearing housing. However, the shaft rotates in the actual bearing. A fully floating bearing system will be a bearing which is able to rotate inside of the bearing housing as well as the shaft is able to rotate inside of the bearing. The specific bearing is a semi-floating. That retaining clip or retaining pin prevents that bearing from rotating inside of the bearing housing. So I'm just going to pop it out from the other side. That is what the retaining pin looks like. It has a little pin on the one end which fits into that little hole over there and the round body of the retaining pin slots into a scallop or a cutout on the bearing over there. Let's clean this bearing up and I'll give you a closer view of exactly what has happened. So normally what we do is you just take a Try and get a thin piece of the cloth and just pop it into the, into the bearing, see if we can get it right through. Just to give it a wipe, it's not the proper way to clean it, you'll obviously need a paraffin bath or whatever, but just wanted to get any dirt away. Now, let's get the bearing onto the shaft in the same orientation that it would be installed as if it was inside of the turbo. So let's go back here. This is the compressor side where the back plate came off. That is the turbine side where the shaft went in. The bearing comes out and fits onto the shaft like that. The bearing gets held in place, the shaft rotates inside of the bearing. Now, this turbocharger did not run for very long and it obviously was audible after it sustained the damage so it must have sounded like a siren because of the imbalance it becomes audible above two grams per centimeter cubed and uh, obviously the driver went and uh, stopped the vehicle or stopped driving called a tow truck he would have noticed a lot of smoke coming out of the back because of the oil leakage and obviously in a diesel engine you can suffer a fire from an engine runaway if you don't because the engine oil gets pumped out of the turbo back into the engine the engine can run on engine oil believe it or not so this bearing system has basically been compromised because of the vibrations induced in the rotating assembly after the damage was created on the inducer blades of the turbine. That is the reason you got the leak. So that's a very simple analysis, it's not difficult. Uh, normally you'd find if the driver had continued to drive uh, the vehicle and he didn't stop even though he saw smoke coming out of the back and he heard an audible sound, normally what would happen is if he continued to drive, uh, if the engine didn't run away, he would have um, the bearing system because of the vibrations would have worn so abnormally that there would have been excessive clearance between the bearing and the shaft which would have, would have allowed a sufficient radial movement and or axial movement to allow these end wheels to touch the, the housings or to make contact with the housings and that would have resulted in a catastrophic failure so you know normally associated with that in order to see whether or not there was a, a, an imbalance in the rotating assembly, especially after extended use, all you'd need to do is ex examine the outer circumference of the bearings and you would see some pit marks. You will see a, a more dull appearance as opposed to the center, more polished appearance. Now normally that is caused when there's a vibration in the rotating assembly and you start getting this pit mark. You start getting these microscopic holes, impact damage on the actual bearing surface itself. Anyway, I think that's about as technical as we want to get for this specific video. Uh, I hope you guys learned something here today. I hope you guys enjoyed that. It's more for the technical guys. It's not a video for everybody. But anyway, like, subscribe, put some comments down below. We'll see you next time.